This is Dr. Bruce Hoffman. Uh, he's speaking on Alzheimer's disease and mild cognitive impairment. Dr. Hoffman is a family physician and director at the Hoffman Center for Integrative and Functional Medicine here in Calgary. In 2017, Dr. Hoffman became the only Canadian currently certified as a shoemaker practitioner for the treatment of chronic inflammatory response syndrome and mold illness. In addition, he is the medical director of the Brain Treatment Center of Alberta, utilizing QEEG and neurobiofeedback to treat brain disorders. He's also a certified Bredesen, did I say that right, Dr. Hoffman? Bredesen, thank you. Recode, reversal of cognitive decline protocol for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Hoffman pre presently treats complex, multi-system, multi-symptomatic diseases, having developed his own roadmap named the Seven Stages of Health and Transformation T model. So just a quick reminder as we welcome uh, Dr. Hoffman to the stage, if you've got questions towards the end, please line up over here on the left side. Actually, we're going to change that. We're going to make it to on the right side so that you're not necessarily in the camera walking across the camera screen. So if you line up on this side by the water table, that would be great. Dr. Hoffman, welcome. Thank you very much. Is, is this, um, Judith, Judith, is this a CME credit uh, yes. day? Yes. So, so one can't mention proprietary labs and supplements and so forth. Is that true? I do not know. Someone who knows? No? Okay, Tracy's saying no. You cannot. You cannot. Michelle said you can't. Okay, good. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me today. This is a this is an astonishing subject and very relevant subject because of the major epidemic of neurocognitive and neurodegenerative diseases that have sort of swept over our culture and, and over our um, population in the last hundred years uh, with the um, increased rise of Alzheimer's disease, autism, Parkinson's disease, traumatic brain injuries. I do believe that in the future there are going to be uh, brain treatment centers and on every street corner just like now there are Botox and laser centers everywhere. I think, you know, if you try and live one day without your brain being efficient, it's extremely stressful and can lead to all kinds of extraordinary um, sort of symptoms of depression, anxiety, and, um, and a decreased life force and fatigue and so forth and so on. So, your subject today is extremely pertinent and you as nutritionists and dietitians and healthcare providers and just general caring for humanity individuals um, are poised at the very epicenter of this transition because food really is at the key of all transformative health outcomes. I think you all know that. But this knowledge is not at the forefront of consensual reality. And we have a, sometimes an uphill battle trying to convince others. Every time you eat, food washes over your genetic code and either turns on or turns off inflammation. And as you all know, inflammation is at the root of all chronic disease, particularly Alzheimer's. And so what we eat, how we eat it, what happens in the GI tract, how it passes through properly through the tight junctions of the GI tract, how it interacts with the vagus nerve and then bidirectionally goes up into the brain and influences the microglia, which are the inflammatory particles in the brain, and how that translates into behavior, cognition, mood, sleep. This is a huge, huge area of research. If you had to look at the, at the forefront of research at the moment, every single discipline. It's all about food, gut, brain. Food, gut, brain. This is at the epicenter of all research in all the disciplines. You cannot treat neurological patients without looking at food and gut. It just doesn't happen anymore. Rheumatology, same. Cardiovascular disease, same. So you have an extreme responsibility, I think, to, to the people you treat to stand proud and stand with as much knowledge as you can as to what it is that you take in through your mouth 
how that transforms into information, genetic information, and how that influences every individual that you see. It's profound. And I congratulate you on this uh, profession that you've taken up. But I just wanted to ask, I was curious, is there a man in the audience here? What happened to the men <laughs> in this profession? <laughs> it would be great if you could uh, educate the masculine mind as to the virtues of good food. Um, men's value systems are quite different from females, as you know, and they often spend most of their time out there creating businesses and trying to provide income for the supportive uh, family structure. And so sometimes they will do their very best to delegate health and nutrition to uh, whoever they can, which is probably most of you. <laughs> so uh, just keep that in mind. Um, now many of you may be in the first half of life where your biological drives and your hormones and your ego strength and your life force have blessed you with enough energy and enough brain speed to really not worry about cognition. You may not worry that your brains are slipping, but, I can t but every decade that we live, our brains slow down by 10 milliseconds. From 300 milliseconds to 400 milliseconds. That's the difference between normal cognition and not being able to formulate a thought. It's just a question of 100 milliseconds. And so you may not be that interested in cognition and how your brain functions if you're on the anabolic side of life. You're building up your life force. You're fulfilling the ego fulfillments of the first half of life, which is to create you know, families and uh, income and education and find the right spouse to procreate the species. And you're driven by these biological drives. But in the second half of life, when entropy sets in, when you start to break down, and your brain does slow down just due to normal aging, everything that we're going to learn today is pertinent and can be helpful as to what you can do to improve your cognition and improve your mental well-being. And so this human brain of ours is extraordinary. It's the interface between our internal and our external worlds. We take in information through our five senses. We process information through our thoughts and beliefs and value systems. And this all gets expressed into daily action. We have one quadrillion synapses. And so your neurons, which transmit all this information, branch out into all these dendrites and synapses. And it's at these synapses where most of this information takes place. Impulses through the brain travel electrically and chemically. The synapses, which are interfacing between the neurons receive electrical signals and they receive chemical signals through the receptors. And the receptors take in information from vitamin D, vitamin E, hormones, and get affected by neurotoxins. And so the synapses with the receptors is at the very interface where cognition takes place and where the difference is between profound brain health or cognitive decline decline and eventual dementia. It's at the synapses where all this occurs. Every act that you do, every act that you perform, is all intermediated through this incredible synaptic connection. These signals travel down through the neurons, hit the receptors, translate into action. As the information comes, goes through receptors, it goes intracellular, turns on DNA, which then turns on RNA, which then translates into da daily actions and behaviors. And your brain, as you probably know, has multiple functions. The frontal cortex is very different from the occipital cortex, is very different from the temporal cortex, is very different from the parietal cortex. And we have an evolutionary understanding of the brain through the reptilian brain, which takes care of the primary functions of sleep, cardiovascular function, gut function, through the limbic brain, which is the emotional brain, and then through the neocortex, where our adult brain develops, which then learns 
is to inhibit some of the impulses from the reptilian and the limbic brain. And so we become socialized and we become adapted to being adults in the world, learning to inhibit our impulses, our fight-flight response, our fears through the amygdala. And this prefrontal cortex only starts to really lay down its last neuronal connections at the age of 25 in women and 30 to 35 in men. And so many of us are not truly socialized to inhibit our impulses until we in our third decades. And it's here where a lot of our cognitive decline ends up. We start cognitive decline in the hippocampus, which is in the medial temporal lobe. And then as neurons progressively die, it starts to spread further and further the brain atrophies until eventually the prefrontal cortex atrophies and individuals are just are no longer able to perform tasks of daily living and they become institutionalized and they're under the care of caregivers. So there's a progressive decline as we go further down the dementia road. So many of you have excellent health, have excellent cognition, don't really worry about how you think, you just take it for granted. The speed of your brain, you take for granted, you think a thought, you process it, take action, it all takes place in, as I said, 300 milliseconds, and there's no slowing down. But for many of you, this isn't always the case. People start to see slippage. Sorry, there's ice in this water. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> and we start to get these synaptic connections being destroyed. And we start to see these symptoms. And these symptoms start to occur. And before long, if we're going down the path of mild cognitive in, uh, impairment to dementia, you lose all sense of yourself. And eventually, you may end up with a reduction in your identity as someone who has a meaningful and purposeful life. And I can tell you, it's devastating to see people, not in their 80s, but in their 30s, presenting in this way, due to various factors. I have a number of patients that I'm working with now, this week, last week, young individuals. Last week I saw somebody at the age of 20 with these symptoms. Extreme cognitive decline. It's termed in parlance, you know, brain fog, but when you really go deeper into it, they lose these critical functions. They can't find words, they can't remember things, they get disorientated, they can't learn new information. They really, their brains are on fire, their brains are shut down. It's devastating. It's devastating to see. And our medical profession, as it exists right now, has very, very little to offer. In fact, I would say it's a bankrupted system in terms of its therapeutic interventions. We go to medical school to learn a specific way of interpreting diseases and a specific way of treating them. And that methodology no longer serves these complex multi-system, multi-symptom patients. It's an outdated system. And we need to tell the truth about it. Alzheimer's is now the third leading cause of death in the United States. It's an epidemic. And who does it reach? Who does it hit? Woman. And it's now more prevalent than breast cancer in terms of its effect upon women. It's amplified by some genetic interferences. I don't know, have any of you done your 23andMe and looked at your profile? Anybody? Yes. I would recommend you do that if you're <laughs> courageous, because sometimes you don't want to see certain things. But there's a gene called the APOE4 gene, and the APOE4 gene is an accelerator of dementia if you're so predestined to go down that road. That's not a death sentence, that's not a negative thing, because there are many, many things you can do upstream to prevent the expression of that gene. And I think it's worth knowing if you have that gene or not. So if you've got your 23andMe, I would, there's a box you have to open, I'd click on that box and look and see, do you have the APOE 3, 4 or 4, 4 gene? And if you do, the talk I'm about to give, or am giving, <laughs> is extremely relevant and I would recommend that you learn everything you can 
about what you can do in lifestyle interventions to change not what is an inevitable outcome, but an outcome that's nuanced or slanted, not in your favor, statistically. There's lots you can do. Lots and lots and lots of things you can do. And the problem, and why this diagnosis of mild cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease is so problematic and prognostically so bad for some people, is because there isn't any treatment out there. There's 80,000 published papers on Alzheimer's disease. 50,000 Alzheimer's disease researchers. Billions of dollars spent. And all of the treatment uh, protocols that have been used so far, which are all usually drug-based, there's very few trials looking at lifestyle interventions. If they do look at lifestyle, they look at a single, a single intervention, then pronounce, usually it doesn't work which is not true because I'll show you how multimodal interventions are the name of the game for future treatment of Alzheimer's. But the abysmal prognosis is because there's the cupboard is bare. There's nothing to offer. There's zero cures for cognitive decline or Alzheimer's disease out there. And this is the only disease of the 10 most common diseases for which there is no treatment to either slow it down or to treat it. There are four drugs used out there, but they don't change the course or outcome of the disease. They may temporarily change some symptoms, but they don't change the outcome. There's lots of progress in other diseases, HIV, cardiovascular disease, cancer. The whole field of cancer has completely changed from chemo radiation to immunotherapies. The whole landscape of cancer is dramatically changing. It's no longer, I mean, cancer is now considered a chronic degenerative disease that you can live with. It's no longer the cancer that, you know, you know, the big C, as they used to say, that you just have to fret about. There's so much you can do now in the world of, of immunotherapy to cheat cancer, but Alzheimer's, not so much. And why is this? Well, because the whole world of Alzheimer's research, uh, research is geared towards what we call N squared, D squared medicine, name of disease, name of drug. That's what I learned at medical school. I mean, you go through all the pre sciences and then you really, what you end up with is, what disease do you have, what drug or what surgical intervention can I put forward? The whole world of functional medicine now looks at it differently, it looks upstream. It looks upstream at causation, you know, antecedents, mediators and triggers of disease expression, genetics, it looks at all different factors. But functional medicine is just in its infancy. The traditional medical system which you, you get for free under Canadian healthcare is based on an antiquated medical education system of 30 years ago. Research has gone far beyond what is now being taught, or I should say, what is now being, what you receive when you go to a doctor's office. The research is 20, 30 years behind. Uh, uh, the research is 20, 30 years in front of what's taught and what you receive at the medical doctor's office. I mean, doctors now are just Finally, learning about probiotics, <laughs> yeah. vitamin D, and even then you can't get vitamin D under Canadian healthcare, it's considered non-essential. Do you know how potent vitamin D is as an immune modulator, as a down regulator of inflammation, as a hormone? You know, if they really understood what vitamin D did, did it would be packaged as a drug and sold everywhere but it hasn't yet in, been introduced in that way to what you receive when you go and see a medical doctor. So N squared, D squared medicine is antiquated. It's historical. And our educational system is 20, 30 years behind what really is going on in the field of research. The other thing about Alzheimer's disease is that Alzheimer's disease, the entire costs and funding and the research has all been about this so-called amyloid plaque. I don't know if you know that Alzheimer's, the real core central histopathological changes are based on changes in the brain, the two of which are amyloid plaque and tau tangles. That's what differentiates Alzheimer's disease from other dementing illnesses. And the entire world of Alzheimer's disease has said, amyloid plaque, oh, we see it. That's the problem. We must get rid of it. So that all the research has been trying to find 
drugs that block the enzyme that makes it or antibodies that destroy it. But this is this misdirected research. And now they're starting to wake up and realize it. They thought, you know, destroying amyloid, amyloid would be the way to treat it. And the other thing that's been sort of prevalent is that they believe in the N squared, D squared model of the medicine that Alzheimer's is one disease. It's not. Many, many, many upstream inflammatory metabolic pathways are at play. And until you sort of identify all of them, you're not going to treat this disease. There's no single cure. There's multimodal interventions which range across a broad spectrum of possibilities like lifestyle, nutrition. Nutrition. Nutrition trumps it all. You have a responsibility to really know your stuff and to teach it and to be proud of it. I mean, nutritionists, I believe, will be the medical practitioners of the future. <laughs> I believe that, sincerely. And they'll form teams with other individuals who can add to the multimodal therapeutic interventions. So know your stuff and really learn the different variations of dietary interventions, supplementation, etc. I really think as we try and transition into the new medicine and the new future, you will be leading the way. So Dr. Dale Bredesen came along and he's been studying Alzheimer's disease for 30 years. And he wrote a book called The End of Alzheimer's. And he published a series of papers. And he really took functional medicine to heart. He went and studied functional medicine. Are all of you familiar with functional medicine? Nobody? Yes. Oh, OK. <laughs> it's too early. So functional medicine is the sort of sweeping the, the world in um, small amounts, not huge amounts. But it, it's functional medicine really looks at um, biochemistry, upstream causation of why diseases get expressed. It doesn't treat the disease, it treats upstream causation. And you know, functional medicine, as sort of taught now by medical doctors, is really just naturopathy you know, with another face. And naturopaths have known forever some of these basic principles. I mean, it was 100 years ago that the, uh, the Menstikoff, the great naturopath, said death begins in the colon. Well, guess what? <laughs> That's right. You know, all these inflammatory diseases of aging start with food and gut, no question. So in functional medicine, it's just riding on the coattails of sound naturopathic principles and then making it into sort of a medical discipline, or naturopathic discipline with guidelines and protocols and outcomes. And uh, Dr. Bredesen studied functional medicine and Alzheimer's and realized all of a sudden through these three papers that he published that, hold on a second, Alzheimer's disease is not a disease that results from amyloid plaque and tau tangles primarily. Yes, they exist, but there's reason for them to exist. And the reason is that Alzheimer's, those tau tangles and amyloids, are actually protective responses to three major metabolic interruptions. Whether they be inflammatory, whether they be trophic withdrawal, that is withdrawal of nutritional and hormonal support, or whether they be infectious and or toxic. He said these are the three major drivers of the amyloid plaque and the tau tangles. Tower tangles and amyloid plaque are the result of the brain trying to protect itself from these insults. And he said, now we've got, to take we've got to take Alzheimer's disease very differently. We've got to look at it very differently. We've got to ask ourselves, how do we identify these subtypes? How do we identify the contributors to these subtypes? And don't get rid of the amyloid. It's a protective response. So instead of using all this research to find the drug to destroy amyloid, don't get rid of amyloid until you find out what's driving it. And he found that there's all these 36 biochemical pathways that drive it and three major subsets. He thinks there's about 80. He's only discovered 36 right now. And then he says, him, what is the brain protecting itself? Why is amyloid and tau produced? And then he says, you've got to inquire and you've got to look upstream. What infections are there? What hormones and nutritional support has been withdrawn. As we age, we get less nutritional and hormonal support. It fades away 
and let's be very vigilant. And especially with the North American diet, as you know, it's uh, you know, calorie dense and nutritionally depleted. And then what metals are in place? What heavy metals? What pesticides? What toxic chemicals? What mold illness? What Lyme disease? What is actually driving this protective response of the brain? And what modifiable actions can an individual take to change the prognostic outcome, which is so devastatingly pessimistic at this stage? This is the new way of looking at Alzheimer's. And he said, you know, these, as far as he said, as far as he knew, there was 36 pathways that drive Alzheimer's. He calls them 36 holes in the roof. And that one disease has multiple ways that it's expressed through multiple biochemical pathways, <coughs> multimodal impl inputs. And that the perfect Alzheimer's drug, if it existed, which it doesn't, would have to address all 36 pathways, which it can never do. Hence, the failure of modern research to find a single drug to treat Alzheimer's. It will never happen. There is no drug. Don't go in search of it. Don't go looking for it. It doesn't exist. It never will, can exist. Because Alzheimer's is a multimodal disease with multimodal inputs, with multimodal expressions. And even that is simplistic. If you look at Bredson's model, he's really looking at level looking at the environmental inputs like toxicology, infections, heavy metals, and their effect on biochemistry, physiology, inflammation. He's only looking at two subsets of a much larger model. I've looked at, thing, I've looked at individuals through a much broader lens through my training in Ayurvedic medicine. Ayurvedic medicine says that there's a number, when an individual presents at your office, there's multiple layers of that person's being from what they call the spirit, which is the unified field, which is that which is outside of ourselves in the quantum domain, to the soul, which is the innermost core of your being, to the mind, which is where you compute thoughts. You have 60,000 thoughts a day. Most of them are the same as the day before. There's <laughs> not much variation. Where you carry beliefs and values and concepts and interpret life according to a particular value system based on early childhood experiences and an emotional body which registers trauma. We know from the ACE study that people with early childhood trauma have three to four times increased negative health outcomes as they age. And then through the electromagnetic spectrum where we are now influenced and bombarded by an extraordinary array of electromagnetic fields when we sleep at night, our whole body goes into a stress response from the electrical fields, the magnetic field, the radio frequency fields. And people just take this stuff for granted. They don't really understand and explore it. When you sleep at night under electromagnetic field, your blood-brain barrier opens. Your body voltage goes up. Things leak through. Melatonin plummets. 31 studies showing that high EMFs reduce melatonin. You don't detoxify through the glymphatic system in the brain. All the toxins you've accumulated, which has led through the leaky blood-brain barrier. You don't make growth hormone. You don't make ghrelin. You don't, I mean, there's many things that aren't made when you sleep under a stressed field. And most inner-city people sleep under a field that is 20 times higher than it should be, according to World Health Organization standards. You live and sleep in a stressed EMF field. One of my colleagues, Dr. Dietrich, colleague, uh, Dietrich, Dietrich Klingard, is fond to say, if you go to bed, how many of you go to bed with your, alarm, with your iPhone alarm on? All of you use it as an alarm clock? Do you put it in airplane mode? Who doesn't put it in? <laughs> Nobody's going to own up. <laughs> who doesn't put it in an airplane mode? Dr. Dietrich Klingert likes to say it's like sleeping next to a Boeing 747. That's the effect it has at that frequency on your biology. And having worked with this field for some time, having looked at people who turn off their phones and create sleep sanctuaries, we see it all the time. We change outcomes. I had one autistic kid, all they did was turn off the EMFs, turned off the router, took out this cordless phones, took out the baby monitor. 
The child who didn't sleep, when, within six weeks, it takes time, within six weeks, sleep was no longer an issue. One intervention, just getting rid of EMF. So it is a profound issue.